With three major hurricanes hitting the United States in just the span of a month, gee, I wonder what could be causing that. We've seen the effect of fear on the economy in ways that we haven't in decades, so let's take this opportunity to discuss supply, demand, and how panic can destroy the economy if left unchecked. Before we get into the nitty gritty, we're going to need a way to visualize what we're going to talk about, which means we're going to need to use a supply and demand graph. Wait, hold on, don't click away just yet, I promise you it's not as boring as you think. Experiences may vary. In order to set up a supply and demand graph, you need to mind your P's and Q's, that is, price and quantity. Next, you'll put the supply line, simply known as S, and in the opposite direction, demand, or D. The D goes down. Yes, I'm aware of the innuendo, and now so are you. Which is why you'll never forget it. And that's it. We don't have to put any numbers or anything like that. At least not for the purposes of this video. If you really want to get into how all the numbers and stuff work, might I suggest a college microeconomics course. I actually really don't recommend that. Don't. Don't do that. All you really have to know is that as you go this way, the price goes up, and as you go this way, the quantity goes up. So intuitively, as you move this way along the supply line, companies are willing to make and sell more of a product because of the higher price. And obviously, as you go along the demand line, the lower the price, the more people are willing to buy. This spot right here is the important bit. It's called the equilibrium price. This is the ideal price where everything that is made is sold. There's nothing left on the shelves and there are no people who want to buy it but can't. As with most of economics, this is just a concept and never really happens. In practice, there will always be extra on the shelf or people going home disappointed. That's just life. But there you go, that's as in-depth as we're gonna get when it comes to supply and demand graphs. I told you it wouldn't be that painful. Another fairly simple concept that I've left out of my previous videos on economics, much to the annoyance of several commenters, is scarcity. This is the idea that there's only a finite amount of something. It's pretty simple, which is why I left it out. If you haven't figured this out by now, my videos aren't exactly geared towards children. I assume you have some sort of base knowledge coming into this. But scarcity is fairly important, especially when it comes to supply and demand. There's only so many or so much of a product, so they have to find that equilibrium where everyone who wants one can get one, and everything that is made is sold. And there are several ways to achieve this, like artificially limiting supply. There are some great examples of this, but the easiest one is probably diamonds. If you didn't already know this, diamonds aren't that special. They aren't even that rare. The only reason that you think they are is because of some great marketing over the decades. And there's almost no difference between a diamond mined from the earth and one grown in a lab. They just want you to think that a jeweler can... You know what? If you want to know more about diamonds and why they're so expensive, Cogito made a video about that. He's a friend of the channel, so check that out. Anyway, the main point is that while diamonds are rather plentiful, they only release a few every year in order to artificially keep the supply low. Doing that keeps the price high. If the market were suddenly flooded with diamonds, the price would plummet. But there are other, less shady ways to limit supply, like making it available for a limited time. The McRib is a great example of this. People love the McRib, even though it's kind of gross, because it's only available a few times a year, though it's actually a lot more like diamonds than you might think. They make McRibs year-round, but they can only make so many of them, so rather than always having it on the menu in certain parts of the country, they shift it around. One city might get it this month, and another city next month. There's a website, McRibLocator.com, where you can find your nearest McRib right now. It might be a bit of a drive, but it is there. If you're not willing to go on a road trip for a pork sandwich, then at least for you, it's only available for a limited time. Which doesn't affect the supply since there's always a McRib somewhere. It just affects the local demand, which keeps the price up. So let's use a more relevant limited time product. The Pumpkin Spice Latte. I hate to ruin the magic for you. Who am I kidding? I love ruining the magic. But A, it's just cinnamon, ginger, and nutmeg. You could probably make one right now if you have a basic spice rack. And B, there's no real reason that they couldn't make these things year round. The spices I mentioned aren't seasonal, and even even if there was pumpkin in it, which there isn't, go to your local bakery in April. They somehow managed to still have pumpkin pies. So why do they only make it available for a limited time? Because it wildly increases demand. Basic people basically look forward to it like Christmas. Which is an apt comparison, really, because the Starbucks Christmas cup works the same way, and generates controversy and therefore demand no matter what. Even if it's just a plain red cup. Anyway, keeping something available for a limited time doesn't necessarily affect supply, but artificially increases the seasonal demand. People don't want to miss out, even if it's something that's fairly abundant. So what about when something fairly abundant suddenly becomes 
not. Let's say that there's a TV show that's been on every single night for decades. It gets a new host and nobody really cares. And since nobody really cares and nobody really watches, they decide to replace the host after only a few weeks. And suddenly, everyone cares. Because something that was common and not all that remarkable has suddenly become limited. So now everyone wants it. Whenever something mildly popular is about to end, it suddenly becomes much more popular. Celebrities know that and use it all the time by going into retirement. But instead of celebrities, let's talk about a product. Twinkies are disgusting, so disgusting that they pretty much have to pay you to eat them. But in 2012, the company went bankrupt and they ended Twinkie production, making them pretty much worth their weight in gold, making them so much money that they got out of bankruptcy and they resumed production nine months later. What's wrong with you guys? Every few years, they seem to do the same thing with bacon, telling us about an imminent bacon shortage which sends demand through the roof and it never actually seems to happen. So let's get to the hurricanes. I actually didn't plan on doing this topic at all, even after someone suggested it on the subreddit. But once Irma was about to hit Florida, I started seeing news articles like this. Orange juice, which most of you rarely buy, became much more expensive because people feared that the hurricane, which hadn't hit yet, would limit the supply in the future. So to visualize that, demand went up because people were worried that the supply would go down. It didn't, but now the price remains high because of the way that we buy and sell commodities like oranges in what we call futures. Futures are basically what it says on the tin. You're not paying for this year's crop, you're paying for next year's. Or in some cases, not even next year's, but like a decade from now. Selling things in futures helps the farmer the most because they're getting paid for a crop that hasn't been harvested yet. And they get paid even if that future crop fails. It also helps the middleman who is gambling on that future crop. If it's successful, they already own a crop before it's harvested and then can sell it to distributors and eventually you for a slightly marked up price. However, they also assume the risk that that crop might fail or be destroyed. What do they do when that happens? They pass that cost on to you, of course. This is what happened with the Dutch and tulips like 400 years ago, where the futures market went crazy and then crops failed and the economy collapsed. But the interesting thing with Irma and oranges is that while the futures price plummeted, current market price remains high. All because of the uncertainty of this year's crop because of the hurricane. We buy and sell oil in the same way with futures. So yeah, let's talk about the gas shortage thanks to Harvey. Unlike oranges, gas is something that we all need whether you like it or not. Unless you live in one of them fancy cities with a thriving public transportation network. There is a reason why it's one of those things that people kill each other for in all of those post-apocalyptic movies. Anyway, knowing that Harvey was coming, they preemptively shut down several refineries on the Gulf Coast. That's it! The refineries were back up and running shortly after Harvey, so gasoline production and therefore supply wasn't really affected. So why were there people out there like this? And this? Because people thought that there might be a shortage, so they rushed to their nearest gas station to fill up their car and trash cans, which then caused other people to fear that there might be a shortage, so they rushed to the gas station and waited in line for hours, and eventually they actually created the shortage that they feared would happen. Demand had risen out of a fear that supply would fall, even though it wouldn't have if everyone just remained calm. It eventually did, causing demand to increase even more. If the market were allowed to function without restriction, this would cause the price to skyrocket as demand increases and supply decreases. Eventually, the increase in price Price should decrease demand. If prices rise for a commodity like gasoline during an emergency like a hurricane, this is called price gouging, and it is in fact illegal. The laws vary state to state, but for the most part, increasing the price for an essential item during a disaster in order to exploit people's fear is not cool. It's important to note that even people who are fairly calm and rational went out to top off their tanks just in case. Better safe than sorry, right? As the saying goes, no single raindrop thinks that they are responsible for the flood. But I mean, really, what's the worst that would have happened if you ran out of gas after a hurricane? This is America. It wouldn't turn into Mad Max, all right? At worst, you would have been out of gas for a few days. And you definitely wouldn't be the only one. So it's not like you would lose your job or people would be shooting each other out on the street for it. But that has happened, just not over gas. Let's say a friend comes up to you and tells you that they went to the bank to withdraw their money, but the bank refused to let them. They suspect it's because they don't actually have the money. And then you might rush to the bank to withdraw yours. Let's say that your friend told a dozen people, 
and they told a dozen people, so on and so forth. Before you know it, the bank actually runs out of money and the rumors become reality. You might think that this sounds ridiculous, but it did actually happen. More than once. One bank closed and then everyone went to their bank to get their money and then that bank closed, so on and so forth. This is called a run on the banks and used to be fairly common. Here's a list of every bank panic just in the United States. We haven't had it happen since the Great Depression when FDR's New Deal put huge restrictions on what banks could do with your money. Funny enough, when they started to loosen those regulations, we got the 2008 financial crisis. Isn't there a saying about those who don't learn history and having to repeat it or something? Anyway, how does a run on the banks even happen? How can a bank just run out of money? It's because of something called fractional reserve banking, which means that when you deposit money into a bank, they only have to keep a fraction fraction of it in reserve, and the rest of it they can lend out. In the US, that number is only 10%. So if you walk into a bank and you deposit $100, they can lend $90 to someone else. This is how banks create money. You have $100 and this person has $90. Both of your bank accounts say those numbers. It doesn't stop there though. That person can deposit their $90 and the bank can lend out 81, then 72, so on and so forth. When it's all said and done, that $100 could have created $1,000 or more. And you know what really sucks? I started this off by saying that you deposited $100, which then created all that other money. But you actually have no idea where you fit into this chain. Your $100 might have been created from someone else's $10 million. So anyway, a bank is only required to keep 10% of its money in actual cash on hand. So if you go to the bank and want to withdraw your money, that's fine, you'll probably get it. But if everyone does, they'll quickly run out of money and eventually close. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, was created after the Great Depression in order to protect consumers in the event of a bank shutting down. If you have an account with a bank that ends up going bankrupt, the FDIC will reimburse you whatever amount you lost up to $250,000, which is why it's kind of risky to have an account with more than that. Not that that's a problem for any of you. So how come in 2008, when banks like Lehman Brothers were closing down, the government didn't just let the FDIC reimburse consumers? Why did they bail out the banks instead? Because when one bank closes down, consumer confidence falls and they go to their bank and get their money out, which closes that bank down, so on and so forth. Eventually, the FDIC wouldn't be able to keep up and the entire economy would collapse. It was actually far cheaper to bail out a few banks for a few billion dollars than it would have been to compensate millions of Americans. After allowing another Great Depression to happen and erasing billions if not trillions of dollars from existence. So while what they did was politically unpopular, it prevented a huge disaster. It's easy to sit here and say that if there's a disaster or a shortage, you shouldn't go out and try to get all you can before it's gone. Because I'm not in the middle of a hurricane. And if banks were closing down left and right, I could probably see myself going to my bank. But fear that the economy will collapse can actually cause the collapse that wouldn't have happened without fear. So the next time someone tells you that some disgusting donut that you never eat is going out of production, or that you should hoard as much of an item as you can because it might run out soon, hopefully now, you'll know better. So what limited time item do you look forward to? Let me know down in the comments and don't forget to hoard that subscribe button. You probably noticed the new intro art thanks to Poe the Wondercat. Check out his information in the description. And thanks to everyone for being so patient with my lack of uploads this last month. If you'd like to keep up on the inner workings of the channel, be sure to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or the subreddit.